Hi everyone, um, my name is Brooke Hutto and I did my theorist presentation on Larry Crabb, um, his late works, um, which is his most current things. Um, I, that's how I did my presentation on. Um, so if you just want to follow along with the PowerPoint um, that I uploaded, that would be great. Um, and also if you look at um, my handout, basically, um, it's it's the same information basically that's on there. So you can follow it along that way as well. Um, but yeah, if you want to just look, so the first slide is Larry Crabb. Um, and there's a picture of him and his wife on there. Um, and actually shows, I'll just go ahead and say too, if you put to stay there or flip to the next page on his biography, um, Larry Crabb actually just passed away February 28th of this year, um, was 77 years old. Um, and he battled cancer for 23 years. Um, and so now is, is I'm sure rejoicing at home with the Lord, um, but did, did just pass away. Um, his wife's name is Rachel. They were married for 54 years, um, has two sons, two daughter-in-laws and five grandchildren total. Um, I won't go over fully all of his education and professional things. That's on the PowerPoint, um, and on the um, handout, but he does have a, a BA in psychology and a master's and PhD in clinical psychology um, and has worked for many schools and done private practice as well. Um, so has a pretty long ministry and career. Um, I will say too, related though to his bio bio biography, is there's two um, kind of personal ministries that he started. Um, and if you would be interested in um, they're very interesting and it seems like very wonderful resources. Um, the first, they're, they are now merged together, but the first is um, New Way Ministries, which he founded in 2002. Um, and technically, I guess it's still kind of going, but it merged with um, his son. One of his sons started the larger story with him. Um, and they kind of merged New May, new Way Ministries into that in 2019. So now, if you want to look up anything about either of those, um, if you just go to largerstory.com, you can kind of find out all about that. Um, and basically, I will just say about that after reading kind of more about him and his story, um, really... Um, at the latter part of his life, he really wanted to create resources for people. Um, he felt like, and he talks about in the books um, that I read for research on him, uh, he even talks about this um, in starting New Way Ministries, he really had felt um, very committed to kind of three particular parts of ministry that he felt the Lord was calling him to um, that are really important parts of uh, lives for believers. Um, which was three things. One was encountering God, like experiencing knowing God. Two um, was experiencing true spiritual community, like within people within the church. Um, and the third was uh, going through spiritual transformation, and which is kind of like more like sanctification. Um, and he, so he really wanted to speak into those things and provide resources for people. Um, related to those three things. So that's kind of where it seems like new ministries, new way ministries came out of. Um, and so some of his books, he talks about uh, hone in on, on those three things. So he talks about, so his books, Shattered Dreams and The Papa Prayer are specifically related to addressing the focus of um, encountering God. His books, Connecting and Becoming a True Spiritual Community, is related to the focus of um, experiencing, experiencing true community within the church. And then his books, The Pressures Off and Soul Talk, those address the spiritual transformation. Um, and so within New Way Ministries, he had a library resources. He had come up with intensive training conferences, internet uh, resources, and courses for people that wanted to grow in spiritual direction um, and in soul care, um, even having like a certificate in soul care and certificate in spiritual direction that he would offer people. So there's a lot of training and resources. Um, and then Larger Story came about with, I think, his son, one of his sons wanting to build on his father's legacy 
Um, and at that point, I believe, um, like I said, he passed away of cancer and he battled it for 23 years. So I think at that point in kind of 2019, he wasn't really physically able to continue to go out and do conferences and do the trainings that he was doing. Um, so they kind of moved a lot of the resources to just being online. And I think that's where larger story comes in as wanting to have a platform where more of it is online and they're able to reach people that way. Um, and it was also to pursue new, newer and younger audiences. Um, so larger story is the, the ministry that they have still going today. Um, so that's a little bit about him. And then if you go to the next slide, I've got kind of a pictures of basically these are all of the books that he wrote um, over the last 20 years. Um, the first one, I believe it's in um, 2001 that Shattered Dreams was released. And then 2020, um, probably five or six months ago now, um, his last book, Waiting for Heaven, uh, Freedom from the Incurable Addiction to Self, um, was released. So he he has got a lot of wonderful, wonderful books. Um, I read for this project, Shattered Dreams and the Pressures Off, and I can just say from a personal standpoint, um, they were highly impactful, and I would recommend them 100%. Um, Shattered Dreams has probably been, after reading it, one of the most impactful books um, that I've probably ever read. So I highly, highly recommend uh, both of them, but especially Shattered Dreams. Um, so I will go into now um, the the kind of theory that it seemed that he had uh, related to epistemology, anthropology, and methodology. And so if you want to go to the next slide, um, I have got epistemology up here. And the two main things that I have saw throughout reading those resources for him was... Um, the two biggest things that he uses as sources of knowledge is the Bible and experience. Um, and I just put in there, just as examples, um, for Shattered Dreams, the whole book really um, is going through the story of Naomi in the book of Ruth. And so, I mean, you can see from that, he's very scriptural basing, you know, what he's saying off of, off of this scripture story. Um, and then in Shattered Dreams, uh, it's not quite the same outline of going through one story to go through the whole book. But, I mean, obviously throughout both books, there's scripture throughout. Um, but just in one point um, in The Pressure's Off, he mentions the Apostle John, who wrote, you know, the Gospel of John, Revelation, and his epistles, 1st, first, first, second, and 3rd John, um, and just gives a specific note in there about those and how um, John is really showing you throughout all three of those in different ways, um, this Emmanuel agenda, which I'll talk about later on. Um, so he very much so is sees the Bible as authoritative and that is a source of where we're finding truth. Um, but then he also very much so, I think, believes in um, looking at personal experience and um, and really our personal experience in helping us draw towards truth, draw towards the Lord, uh, which and then would draw us to scripture, which would tell us truth. Um, but especially related to Shattered Dreams, um, that's kind of the whole purpose of the book is him saying, hey, the shattered dreams in your life, the things that have not worked out the way that you wanted to go, the, the, the things that have brought the most pain into your lives, that is what God is using to draw you to himself. Um, he is going to use those for good and he wants you, he wants to use those so that you will learn that he is your greatest desire. He is the one that fulfills all of your needs. Um, so I would say, and, and through more things that I'll go over more, I mean, very much so values, uh, personal experience, um, and how it can kind of help show where you're at emotionally, what you truly believe um, and then being able to look at scripture and look at who God is um, to guide us towards the truth, which is found in scripture. Um, and so just kind of go over these uh, briefly, but I also put in here under epistemology um, some presuppositions that he believes um, about God that I think help inform 
his anthropology and his methodology. So there's several points here that I made. Um, there was There's a whole bunch of wonderful things that I feel like I learned in those books. So it was hard to kind of narrow down uh, what to put in here. But we'll just say, so I'm just going to read off these um some of the presuppositions that he holds to is one that um, God is the one in whom all of our true needs and desires are met. Uh, God uses all of our shattered dreams and our pain and our experiences in this life to draw him to himself, which is, and to know him. Um, he believes God does want us to be happy and to have our needs and desires met. And so he very much holds to the fact that we are needy people, that we that we have needs and that we do have desires and those aren't a bad thing or a wrong thing. Um, and that God does want to meet those needs um, and desires. Um, it might not necessarily be in the way that we want to, but he knows what is best and what will truly satisfy us and that he does want to meet those needs. Um, another really big and I think impactful thing that he believes and talks about that, uh, informs for sure his methodology is this reality that he talks about. He says, sometimes God remains silent toward us in order to grow our desperation and desire for him that outweighs feelings. Um, and I just think that's super impactful, especially as when we think about when we reach out to the Lord and we feel like he's silent, especially in our deepest pains. Um, that it's still true, like God does still love you and he is working, um, but that he does choose to remain silent at times. Um, but it is in order to grow our desperation and desire for him, to get us truly to the place where we truly desire him and just knowing him more than we desire blessing. Um, the next one is that God's commitment to his own glory ensures our joy. Um, and a good point, I'm just going to read um, part from one of his books. He says, God's commitment to his own glory ensures our joy because he glorifies himself by revealing his character. And his character is love. And if we truly believed that that's who his character was, that he loved us, we would be able to rest. Um, and he says that infinite pleasure is possible through Jesus. And it is the spirit that wants to awaken us to that. Um, and then a couple more, um, he believes God is working for his agenda, which he calls the Emmanuel agenda, um, rather than ours, and nothing will thwart his agenda. Um, and what he, when he talks about the Emmanuel agenda, he mentions it several points, but basically it is that his agenda is for God to be our God. He wants to make us a people that will worship him and cling to him in absolute dependence. Um, he wants to be with us, to dwell with us. He wants to make us into a people who value him above every other blessing um, and to reveal to us the fact that he is our greatest treasure. Um, and so being in relationship with him and knowing him is what truly will bring delight to our souls. Um, and... A couple more. So there, he also holds to and, and talks a lot, a lot about this in both books. Um, basically is that there is an old way of living and a new way of living. Um, and he calls those, the old way is the law of linearity and the new way is the law of freedom. Um, and basically he's saying we live in our natural selves, this old way of living, which is based in the law. And it is this law of linearity or this kind of sequence um theory where like if we do A, then B will happen, right? If we work really hard, if we do really good things, then we'll get blessings. Um, and that's a lot of involved in control. Like we are trying to control our lives. We're trying to figure things out, make life work the way we want it to work, um, gain blessings, gain pleasure and happiness for ourselves. That's what our greatest desire is that we think it is, that that's what we want. Um, and that is the the old way of living and he talks about the new way of living is living in the spirit and it is the law of freedom and that basically is where we um that's where you have freedom basically to trust in God and know that he is the one that is actually in control um that we can trust God 
and believe that anything that he allows into our lives is for our ultimate good. Um, and that our biggest desire, you know, and needs are wrapped up in, in knowing God. Um, and then the final one, presupposition, um, which is kind of mentioned a lot, is and especially in this, the, the old way of living, um, the law of linearity, is basically that the devil's message that he's always going to, to push you with is that your deepest enjoyment is in something other than God. And that that is what you should seek is your greatest desires and joys. They're found in something else, not in actually just being in God's presence and knowing him. Um, so those are the, some of the biggest parts of, I think, epistemology for him of what he believes is true and what informs the rest of um, anthropology and, and his methodology of how to actually counsel and how do we actually help people. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, it's anthropology. And I've got a little less points on that one. But um, so the first thing that he talks about is related to human beings um, and really believes is that we are utterly dependent and helpless beings. We do not naturally acknowledge or admit this. We seek to control, manipulate, and live on our own terms. Um and again, this is talking about law of linearity, but I just wanted to mention this. Um, is some points in his book. He says, we naturally want blessings in this life and to feel pleasure and happiness. We want to know how to fix things that are wrong. We want to know how to get what we want to get the better blessings of life, which that's another term that he uses for the old way of living or the law of linearity. He also calls it the better life of blessings. That's what we seek is this better life of blessings. Uh, we think we're in control, uh, but obviously we learn that control is an illusion, our control. <laughs> we're not in control. Uh, we are in bondage, this law of linearity. Um, we think, and again, that's the A kind of equals B or A leads to B. So many examples of that are like if I parent my kids you know, in the Christian way, then they'll turn out good and kind and successful. If I do A, then we'll get B. If I eat healthy and exercise a lot, then I will not get sick. Uh, we tend to think that that's how life works. Um, but, you know, you live long enough and you realize that's not how life works. Um, things happen that we cannot explain and are not in our control at all. And a lot of really painful things happen that we're not in control of. Um, and he makes a really good point. He says, we maneuver and we do not trust. We negotiate, we do not worship. We analyze and interpret to gain control over what happens, and we do not depend. Uh, we seek the better life of God's blessings over the better hope of his presence. And he talks about that's actually where pressure comes from. So his book that's called The Pressure's Off is really a lot about that, about this old way of living and new way of living, and the fact that the old way of living creates so much pressure because we feel like we have to make everything work. Um, we have to figure out what we have to do to get what we want, which is we want blessings naturally. We don't really want God. We want blessings. Um, and so, and I mean, that goes into the next point of anthropology. So I've, I've talked about the first one, said that, and then, well, really, we just went over the second one too, is we naturally seek the old way of living, the law of linearity, or the better life of blessings, when what we need and what our souls truly long for is the new way, which is the law of freedom, the better hope of intimacy. Um, the next thing that he believes and talks about is he says, you know, we bear the image of the eternal community, which is the Trinity, and therefore can find our deepest satisfaction only through intimate relationships with this perfect love and nothing else will do. So our true need and our true desire is really actually found in God and knowing God. And so he says that our problem as humans, our problem is that we look to feel here on this earth what we will only be able to fully feel and experience in heaven. We don't believe that God is the one that can and will make us truly happy. We like the old way of living where we believe that we have control. Um, and it just a... a Another side note to that as well is something he writes in his book. He says, the moment that we let our desires for blessings become demands, 
in the moment we expect blessings to come because we've met the requirements for God to grant them. The moment we think that any blessing other than nearness to God is essential to life and is therefore promised now, we've chosen to live the old way. Um, and then again, the last one, our greatest need is for fresh encounter with God, um, experiencing God, and where he exposes our sin as repulsive and reveals that our determination to make this life work, no matter how we go about it, is also repulsive sin. All right, and then methodology. Um, several things, I've got two slides here on that. Um, the several things that he holds pretty dearly to as far as counseling and the ways in which to address kind of our issues. Um, one is to keep focus on eternity and the fulfillment that will come then. He urges people to let go of the false hope that fulfillment is in this life. So he, wanting you to keep a focus on eternity, knowing if you're expecting perfection on this life, if you're expecting full joy, it's not possible in this life. That's going to be in heaven where we're face to face with God. Um, the next thing he says is embrace. Do not fight the shattering in this life. It is what God is using to help you discover that he is your true delight. Um, and along with that, the third one, be gut honest about your pain. You must not sanitize the story. It paves the way for hope. And so along with that, second and third one is basically he's very, very adamant about you must be honest. You must be willing to walk through the pain that God takes you to. Um, because if you're not, you're not going to discover your true desire for God. Um, and he has a great, great, great point. Um, he says, if we deaden our pain, we are being like Buddhists who believe that we should not desire things. But we are not meant to be dead. We are meant to be alive. To deaden pain means to eliminate all hope of joy. The way of Jesus is actually to deepen desire. So allow your pain to take you through the depths where the Spirit can show you your truest desire for God that is enduring and fully satisfies past the physical blessings that come and go in this life. Uh, which I just thought was wonderful. Um, then he talks about abandoning yourself to God, um, which is just giving up control and letting the cross bring you confidence about how God feels about you. So letting scripture, letting the gospel of what Jesus has done for you, how much he loves you, letting that give you confidence to know God is working for your good, um, that you can give up control over your life and allow whatever he comes, whatever he brings into your life to happen, knowing it's for your ultimate good. Um, then the last two, he talks about drawing near to God um, and that we have as a promise in the word. You draw near to God and because of the new covenant, he will draw near to you. He says in his word, he will draw near to you. Um, but another great point is that uh, in that he said, he talks about the importance to, to know that how we come to God does not guarantee how God will come to us or when he'll let us feel his presence with us. Um, nothing that we do can make that happen. But since the new covenant is now in place, drawing near to God does guarantee that he'll draw near to us in his own time and in his own way, not because of the merit of our coming, but because of his gracious promise to draw near to us if we draw near to him. Um, and so in that uh, time of, of waiting to feel the Lord's presence, to know that he's drawing near to us, he talks about waiting well and how that looks like immersion in scripture, corporate worship, relational prayer, and sacrificial service. Um, the final part in methodology that I just thought was helpful um, to talk about is, I believe in the Pressures Off book, he gives these five foundational blocks of living um, in the new way of the spirit. And those are one, reflect on where you are, which is basically being honest. Be honest about where you are. Be honest about your pain. Be honest about what you truly believe um, about God, about yourself. To recognize the fork in the road that's always before you, which is the fork of, are you going to live in the old way or are you going to live in the new way? Um, the third is refocus your goals. And basically that's helping you see what are God's goals for your life? What is, you know, he's saying that he is the one that actually meets all your desires. Um... So what is his goals? And we must, we must know that we need to be focused on those because that is what God is accomplishing. He's not necessarily accomplishing our agenda and our goals to make a certain amount of money, to have a certain spouse or kids or, you know, have this kind of life that we want, the better blessings. He has other goals in mind. And as Crab states before, he believes that 
um, God is working in every believer to do those three things that I mentioned at the beginning, which is to bring about an encounter with him, to bring about a spiritual community, and to bring about a transformation, um, which is like sanctification. Um, the fourth thing is realize what God, that realize what God provides as the means of grace. Um, and in that he talks about the sevenfold, that there's a sevenfold work of the spirit, um, which is those seven things, the seven things that the spirit does. One reminds us of what Jesus has said to us. Two glorifies Jesus. Three pours out God's love for us on us. Four assures us that we are secure in Christ. Um, five is sealing us, sealing us to know that we can never be separated from God and his love. Um, six is anticipation, um, anticipating what is to come in eternity. And the seventh thing is anointing, anointing from the spirit, um, which is him giving us guidance and, um, uh, wisdom and counsel in how to move forward and how to act wisely in our lives, um, and respond to the challenges that we have in life. Um, and then the fifth thing is reorient, reorient your prayer life to match the new way living. And he calls this, this right kind of prayer is the Papa prayer, which he wrote a book about. Um, but Papa is P-A-P-A -A, and it stands for P, present yourself to God as you are. A is attend to where you notice God's presence or absence. The second P is purge yourselves of whatever at that moment might be keeping you from noticing more of God. And the second A is approach God with abandonment and confidence, dedicating yourselves anew to coming to know him and enjoy and, re and reveal him, not to use him to make your life better. Um, and then lastly um, is agreements and disagreements. And I will just say as a blanket statement, I genuinely agree with pretty much everything <laughs> that he wrote in his books. Like I said, I, I really can't... Uh, personally recommend them enough. Um, but two, two big agreements that I have that it shows here on the handout in the PowerPoint is the first is that God uses our pain to draw us to himself and to see the emptiness of chasing pleasure from anywhere else. And the second is um, the importance of spiritual direction, whether through a counselor or a small group where people are honest and humble and looking together to see how the spirit is already working in a person's life. And that's kind of, he talks about that in his books about almost like kind of redefining what counseling should be. Um, and, and seems like he kind of wants to rename it to be spiritual direction. Um, but believing that again, in a place and in a relationship where there's a person who is more trained, which is why he, he made those resources, um, to train people to give spiritual direction or to be spiritual directors for others, um, wanting to train people in that. And the training is basically to help walk along somebody else and say, here's where I see the spirit working in you, working through your pain, working through the problems that you're coming to counseling for to see the spirit's already working in that basically. Um, and just that that's really important. And I, I agree with that. Uh, whether it's through a one-on-one -on -one counselor uh, relationship or even through a small group, he talks about that can happen through like, a church small group. Um, and then disagreements, uh, they're not so much disagreements, but more so, um, because of the, the particular topics, um, I do not disagree with what he said in the book about them, but I just think that's why I put in their dangers. Like, uh, I think that they could be taken to an extreme, which would be dangerous and would be wrong. Um, and the first is that there's a point in which he talks about related to spiritual direction is looking at a person, looking internally and looking at their, for their, uh, inmost truth. And I just think what he meant by that, and he speaks about in the book is, the point of that is to look inward as far as what do you truly believe? How do you truly feel? Um, because that can help identify for you. Well, what do you believe? You know, and is, is what you believe about God and yourself? Is it true? You know, hold it up to scripture. Is that true? But then also it can help you see, are you living the old way of the law of linearity or are you living in the new way of the spirit? And so he's like, that's, he, he talks about the fact that that's important to do is to look and see what do you actually believe. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with that, but I think using those terms, that term of 
finding your inmost truth, um, I think just can be dangerous because in our secular world, we hear that a lot these days of your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And just kind of that truth is subjective to whatever we all want. Um, and I, that's not what Larry Crabb is advocating. It's not what I would advocate. And so I just think it could be dangerous to kind of use that terminology of inmost truth or your innermost truth. Um, because you wouldn't want people to think, oh, well, I just need to look inside of myself and find the truth. Um, because we do not hold that that's where all the, your truth is found. It's found in scripture. It's found through the Lord. Um, and then a second one, again, more of a danger, um, would just be, we, he talks about your neediness, our neediness as people, um, in Shattered Dreams in the beginning of the book. Um, I personally agree with his, his, uh, belief that we are needy human beings. Um, but, and I mean, as he, he, I think believes in this too, estates, all of our needs can only truly be met by God. Um, our need for love and acceptance and, um, and even true forgiveness, you know, that's our greatest need is forgiveness from the Lord for sin, but also knowing that we were made out of love for love and relationship, that we do need that. And, but we need it most fully in God. And if we are expecting other people to do that for us, uh, we're going to set ourselves up for unrealistic, unrealistic expectations and a lot of hurt. And so, uh, he just, he talks about that for a good little bit in the beginning part of Shattered Dreams, just mentioning our neediness. Um, and like I said, I just think that there can be danger in talking about our neediness, um, in needing to like notice that our needs are fully met by God and he's the only one that can fully meet them. Um, other people cannot offer that and they cannot give that to, to any of us. So, uh, it's just a por important thing, I think, to remember and to be careful of the way in which it's talked about. Um, so that is my presentation. And um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it and hope you're doing well. Thanks for listening.